Today we're going to talk about the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. Let's recall a few definitions before we continue. Say that F is a complete ordered field, and let's say that capital A is a sequence. That is a collection of numbers x sub n, which are indexed by the natural numbers n. In this case, we'll count 0 as a natural number. We'll say that the sequence converges to an element L if, given any positive epsilon, we can find a delta such that, in absolute value, xn minus L is less than epsilon whenever n is greater than delta. We'll say that this sequence increases without bound if, given any positive epsilon, we can find a delta such that xn is greater than epsilon whenever n is greater than delta. We'll say that this sequence decreases without bound if, given any positive epsilon, we can find a delta such that x sub n is less than negative epsilon whenever n is greater than delta. If the sequence either increases without bound or decreases without bound, we'll say that the sequence diverges. Otherwise, we'll just say that our sequence does not converge. Recall that our sequence is monotone if it is either monotone increasing or monotone decreasing. Monotone increasing means x sub n plus 1 is greater than or equal to x sub n, and monotone decreasing means x sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to x sub n. The monotone convergence theorem, simply put, says that every monotone sequence converges. Let's explain. Say that our sequence is monotone increasing. If it has an upper bound, then the sequence converges. Otherwise, the sequence increases without bound. If the, monotone, if the sequence is monotone decreasing and has a lower bound, then the sequence converges. Otherwise, the sequence decreases without bound. In a complete ordered field, we found that square roots always exist. Indeed, we can define a square root in terms of the supremum of a certain set, as you see here on your screen. If we'd like to actually compute the square root of a number, we need to construct a couple of sequences. First, we can construct the sequence that is monotone increasing and gets closer and closer to the square root of p. You'll see so by defining the sequence t sub n recursively. Similarly, we can define a sequence that is monotone decreasing and gets closer and closer to the square root of p. Here we have a sequence b sub n that you see on your screen. Before we continue, we'd like to have some motivating questions based on the logistic equation. The monotone convergence theorem gives a criteria for when a monotone sequence either converges or diverges. But what about a general sequence? Is it easy to know when it either converges or diverges? Let's take a look at a sequence that we've seen in the past to get some intuition here. We'll define our sequence capital A recursively in terms of the logistic equation. That is, x sub n plus 1 equals rho times xn times 1 minus xn. We state a few facts. First, let's assume that our parameter rho is the number between 1 and 4. If our starting value x0 is between 0 and 1, then every value in the sequence is between 0 and 1. That is, our set A actually forms a bounded sequence. Moreover, if our starting point x0 is either 0 or 1, then every term in the sequence x sub n will always be 0. In other words, as long as our parameter rho is between 1 and 4, we can think of the function that takes a real number x and returns the number rho times x times 1 minus x as a map that takes numbers x between 0 and 1 and returns numbers between 0 and 1. Let's try to explain why the proof why this proposition is true. We'll do so by induction. Consider the statement p sub n that simply says that the nth term x sub n is between 0 and 1. The base case is true because this is the assumption on x sub 0 that it is between 0 and 1. So let's assume that our x sub n is between 0 and 1 for some n equals to m. We'll now consider the next case when n is m plus 1. 
but this just comes from looking at the equation rho times x sub m times 1 minus x sub m. It's just simply a matter of checking a couple of inequalities to make sure that this new x sub n, when n is m plus 1, really is between 0 and 1. So we conclude that our proposition is true for all non-negative integers n. Let's show the second statement by induction. That is, if x sub 0 is either 0 or 1, then every x sub n will be 0. The base case is true, of course, because x sub 1 will be 0 whenever x sub 0 is either 0 or 1. So let's assume that the proposition is true for some integer n equals m. But again, this is easy to check, because if x sub m is 0, then we plug this in for the formula rho times x sub m times 1 minus x sub m to see that the next one, x sub m plus 1, is also 0. So we conclude that the statement must be true for all positive integers n. Let's consider some examples. We'll first take a look at the case when our parameter rho is between 1 and 3. When rho is equal to 1, here we see that we have a sequence that perhaps starts at x0 is 1 third, and we'll see that this steadily decreases until we approach 0. On the other hand, when rho is equal to 2, we can start at x sub 0 being 1 third, and we see that our sequence slightly increases until we get to 0.5, namely 1 half. When rho is equal to 3, again we see that our sequence is increasing. It starts at 1 third, x0 is 1 third, and it ends in all of the other cases, x sub n being 2 thirds. Let's increase rho a little bit more. Rho here will be between 3 and roughly 3.4. That is 1 plus the square root of 6. Let's start with rho equal to 3.1, and again we'll set x sub 0 equal to 1 third. In this case, by looking at the first 10 terms in the sequence, we really don't see a pattern. It's hard to understand what's happening here. Let's increase rho a little bit more, now to 3.2. Again, we'll choose x sub 0 to be 1 third. Again, by looking here at the first 10 terms, we don't see that there is an obvious pattern to what's happening. Let's increase rho a little bit more. Now rho will be 3.3. .3. Again, we'll choose x0 to be 1 third. And again, we really don't see a pattern here by looking at the first 10 terms. So instead, let's take a look at even further out in the sequences. Again, let's take a look at rho being 3.1. Now we can see that the 40th through 50th terms do seem to give us a pattern here. Our numbers are bouncing back and forth between two limits. That is 0 0.558 and 0 0.765. Curiously, the same thing happens if we increase rho slightly to 3.2. We see that our numbers here are bouncing back and forth between two between 0 0.513 and 0 0.799. And if we increase rho just a little bit more to 3.3, .3, we again see the same type of pattern, that we're bouncing back and forth between two numbers. That is 0 0.479 and 0 0.823. In other words, if our rho is between 3 and 1 plus the square root of 6, that is roughly 3.44, there seem to be two sequences of interest if we look at the even versus the odd indices. So let's take a look at two different sequences by pulling out numbers from our sequence A. We'll either look at B, which just looks at x2, x4, x6, all of the ones in the form x sub 2k, and we'll look at B prime which will consist of x1, x3, x5, all of the numbers in the form x plus x sub 2k plus 1. We have a general statement now. Let's choose rho to be 1 and 4, and let a be that sequence defined by the logistic equation as before. If rho is between 1 and 3, and if x0 is neither 0 nor 1, then we see that our sequence converges to rho minus 1, divided by rho. On the other hand, let's assume that our rho is between 3 and 1 plus the square root of 6, 
And again, x0 is neither 0 nor 1. Then our sequence A does not converge. But as we observed before, if we consider two sets, namely B, which just consists of those numbers coming from the even indices, and B prime, consisting of those numbers coming from the odd indices, then we see that we actually have two different limits given by the formulas that we have here on the screen. We'd like to emphasize that this is part of a general phenomenon that will correspond to what's called the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Let's consider a sequence A, like what we've been doing all along. A subsequence B is a subset that is also a sequence. That is, if our sequence A consists of numbers in the form x sub n, then we'll consider a sequence subsequence B to consist of numbers in the form x sub capital N1, x sub capital N2, x sub capital N n where now this new set of indices will put this together into a set that we'll write as script P, which will consist of capital N1, capital N2, and so forth. Notice that this must be an infinite subset of the natural numbers. There's a celebrated theorem by Bolzano and Weierstrass that goes as follows. Let's assume that we have a bounded sequence. That is, each term x sub n in absolute value is less than or equal to m, then this sequence has a convergent subsequence. That is, we can pull out terms of the form x sub capital N n, and this sequence will now converge. This result was first shown by Bernardus Bolzano in 1817, and later discovered independently by the German mathematician Karl Weierstrass in the 1860s. For this reason, we often put these two names together and call this the bolzano weierstrass theorem. In fact, Bolzano himself is the same person who is credited with the epsilon delta definition that we're using here in this course for the definition of a limit. Let's skim over the proof of the bolzano weierstrass theorem. The proof is a little bit strange, so I do recommend that you pause this video at points to let some of the concepts sink in. Now recall that we have a sequence capital A that consists of elements in the form x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2. Once we fix a subscript n, we can take a look at those m's where m is x sub m is less than x sub n. So let's do the following. Let's consider just those indices n such that x sub n is greater than x sub m whenever m is greater than n. You can think of this as we have a peak in the sequence. That is, as we go through the sequence x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, at some point when we're at x sub n, the sequence will dip down a little bit, maybe going from x sub n and down to an x sub m for some m further out in the sequence. Those ends for which we have a dip and the sequence seems to decrease a little bit will put together into a set P. The goal here of the proof is to consider two cases. If P is an infinite set, then we can simply use the fact that this actually allows us to construct an increasing sequence. If P is finite, we're then going to use this to construct a decreasing sequence. So let's consider the case where p is indeed infinite. So that means that we can write our set p in terms of capital N1, capital N2, and so forth. So let's pull out the x sub n's that correspond to these. By definition, this will be a subsequence of our sequence a. But from the way that we've constructed the set p, we actually see that we have a monotone increasing sequence. Again, remember that the way that we've chosen these indices n for our set P means that at some point later in the sequence, our x sub m will be less than x sub n for some point m further out in the sequence from n. But now A is a bounded sequence, so we see that B is a bounded sequence, which has an upper bound. 
In fact, B must be a monotone increasing sequence. So the monotone convergence theorem says that we do have a limit. So our set, our sequence B, does indeed converge. Now let's consider the more difficult case where P is a finite set. In this case, let's simply list at the elements as n sub 1, n sub 2, through some n sub d. What we're going to try to do is construct a subsequence based on the fact that this set here is finite. So let's consider the following statement. P sub n says there exists two integers, capital N sub n prime and capital N sub n plus 1 prime, that are not in our set P, such that capital N sub n plus 1 prime is greater than capital N sub n prime, and x sub capital N sub n prime is less than x sub capital N sub n plus 1 prime. What's happening here is this. We'd like to say that as we're going through our sequence A, at some point we want to look at this element x sub capital N sub n prime. We should be able to go further out in the sequence to some capital N sub n plus 1 prime, and then we should find a larger element, x sub capital N sub n prime, than we did before. So again, what we're doing here is we're constructing an increasing sequence. We're going to prove the statement is true by induction. For the base case, we simply use the fact that our set P must be a finite set. That is, let's pick some n sub 1 prime that is greater than each of the elements in our finite set P. In particular, our capital N sub 1 prime cannot be in the set P. So we see that there is some capital N sub 2 prime larger than capital N sub 1 prime where we find a larger element x sub capital N sub 2 prime than is cap for x sub capital N sub 1 prime. Again, remember how the set capital P is defined. We said that we're looking for these subscripts n such that x sub n is greater than x sub m, where m is larger than n. That is that in this case, the sequence will decrease at some point. But since we only have finitely many peaks in our sequence, then this means that our sequence will have to be consistently increasing and increasing at some points. This is why we can find our x sub capital N sub 2 prime larger than our x sub capital N sub 1 prime. Since we know that the base case is true, let's assume that the proposition p sub n is true for some n equals m. To do the inductive step, the argument is almost exactly the same as in the base case. We'll let you go ahead and read the details on the screen. So we now know that this proposition is true for all positive integers n. But we're not quite done with the proof. Let's let p prime be the set that we've just constructed by induction. That is this capital N sub 1 prime, capital N sub 2 prime, and so forth. In this case, we just have shown that our P prime is an infinite set, so let's construct a subsequence B prime by looking at these indices. We see by construction that we have a decreasing sequence, and so by the monotone convergence theorem again, we see that this new subsequence does indeed converge. I'd like to end this by discussing a few examples and go back to the logistic equation. Let's return to our sequence coming from the logistic equation as before. Remember that if our parameter rho is between 1 and 3, then our sequence does indeed converge to a limit. If our rho is a little bit larger between 3 and roughly 3.44, that is 1 plus the square root of 6, we have seen that our sequence does not converge. However, in the parlance of what we've just done, there are two subsequences, namely those coming from the even indices and those coming from the odd indices, which do indeed converge. Now let's say that our row is larger than what we've seen before. Let's pick row to be 3.5, which is greater than 1 plus the square root of 6. 
we can work out the numerics and place them in the table that you see here. You'll notice that we have four interesting subsequences. The first two, let's say the first one here corresponding to when n is a multiple of four, and the second corresponding to when n is one more than a multiple of four, are monotone increasing sequences. They start at one third and they increase, or they start at 0 0.77 and they increase. The latter two, namely when n is two more than a multiple of four, or when n is three more than a multiple of four, are actually monotone decreasing sequences. This actually means that for our sequence A, we have four different convergent subsequences. This is part of a larger phenomenon. Here on your screen, you see what's called a bifurcation diagram. This tells us that we know that our limits should be a function of our parameter rho, and here we're actually plotting out on the so-called x-axis as rho is increasing from 1 to 4, and on our so-called y-axis, the limit of these sequences. For example, the smaller region that you see to the left is exactly the plot rho minus 1 divided by rho. Remember that this is the limit we would find if rho is between 1 and 3. In the middle, you can see that we have our limit bifurcate. That means that as rho increases, and if it's between 3 and 1 plus the square root of 6, then we actually have two different limits. This explains why we have two different subsequences. And if we increase rho a little bit more, rho greater than 1 plus the square root of 6, you can now see that we have four different limits. These were the four subsequences that we saw on the previous screen. Thanks very much for watching.